Sloppy Catters. Today we have the pleasure of another interview with Dr. Jean Hovey, who has done a number of interviews with us. And I will include a link to all of those in the About section if you're watching this on YouTube, or um, they will be linked to the, within the article that you're reading. So Dr. Jean is a holistic vet who is based in Denver, and she has an, a fantastic website filled with awesome information uh, called Little Big Cat, and I will link to that as well. She also has a book on Amazon, an e-book, that you can download, What Cats Should Eat, How to Feed Your Cat for Optimal Health. And today, Dr. Jean is going to talk to us about geriatric cats. Hi, Dr. Jean. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Jenny. Good to talk to you again. Yes. I, so I posted, as you know, um, on our Facebook page that we were going to do another interview, and everyone was very excited and sent me questions and whatnot. So I figured we would start kind of in a general realm and then move into their specific questions if that works for you. Sure. That works. Okay. So the first question that I have down is, at what age is a cat considered to be a geriatric cat? Well, it kind of depends on who you're talking to and what you want to call geriatric. The pet food companies now like to say that they're um, mature at 7 and geriatric at 10, 11, 12. But I think even for cats, um, age is kind of a state of mind you know, and if you if you feel good, it just doesn't matter. So, um, you know, but what I consider geriatric would be probably between ten and twelve, and because they get a they get a certain look, and part of that is that uh, as they get older, their irises tend to develop little holes in them, and they start to look a little lacy, and yes. a little spider webby, and you know that. To me, is that's a sure sign that the cat is is um, getting up there. And my my cat is almost he'll be 17 next month, and that didn't happen for him until like a year or two ago. And he's still spry, you know. It's it's um, and and he's a, the same pain in the butt he's always been. So <laughs> um, you know, it is it's it's how they you know how they feel and because. Like the pet food companies do this whole thing. Well, it's kitten, adult, mature adult, senior. Uh, well, a lion in the wild eats the same thing the day he's weaned as he's going to eat the day he dies for his whole and entire life. So mucking around with the, um, with the nutrients and the balances and stuff, if it's a good food, they can eat it forever. Although I do, of course, recommend finding several foods and rotating amongst them uh, right. because, you know, variety is the spice of life for everybody. Yes. That's a good point on the uh, uh, lion is going to eat the same thing throughout their lives. and the, uh, Yeah, they don't only eat elderly antelopes or something. Right, <laughs> right. Nap it, so. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so... When you – obviously, you mentioned the iris thing, and I, I've always called it a marbling because that's what my cat Rags' eyes looked like when he was an old man. Um, yeah. If, and, you look with, if you look with an ophthalmoscope, it's actually kind of ho- little holes in the iris. It's like the iris gets real thin, and you can oh. see the retina through it, and the retina is black, so that's why it looks like that. Now, there uh, is another condition where they get literally spots on their irises that are – brownish to blackish, those are actually iris melanoma. Oh. And if, if they grow fast or if they change, you know, noticeably, then you want to talk to an ophthalmologist because, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, my ophthalmologist here said, yeah, that's always what it is. It's always melanoma and it's always malignant. And what we don't know, because we don't, do a necropsy or postmortem on every single old cat. We don't know if that's affecting other organs or other things going on in there. Melanoma is a nasty cancer in people, so I don't know. But 
if you have a if you see a spot that is really changing, it is probably worth getting having that operated, and, and uh, they will um, they will burn it out with a laser. It's, you know, and oh, that's the, it's nice. A, yeah. I thought you were going to tell me they're going to remove the eyeball, but that's a better. Solution. Well, they can if you can't afford the laser surgery. I suppose it's it's cheaper to take out the eyeball, but I I wouldn't if I didn't right. have to. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay. So I know uh, one of the cats that, that had that done, but we were glad that we did because it turned out to be a very malignant tumor, very oh, good. high causing problems. Right. All right. So what are some of the things, in addition, obviously, to these eye things to watch for in a geriatric cat? And it sounds like... Uh, Maybe a cat owner doesn't necessarily need to be looking at the irises like that. That's more of a vet thing to do. Well, but you're the one who's going to notice a spot and notice that two weeks from now it's twice the size. Yes. You know, I mean, doesn't everybody look deeply into their cat's eyes every day? I mean, come on. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my son dance has developed this habit of just staring. <laughs> if I don't notice it, then he whacks me across the face with his paw. Like, um, excuse me, but my bowl is not in a state of welcoming. <laughs> you, know, you know, they're so funny. And, and when you've been together as long as you are with a with an older cat, you know, you, it's just like an old couple. You know? Oh yes, it's fantastic. Yes. Yeah. So the the two things that I really watch for with older cats um, would be well three appetite thirst and weight loss thirst drink drink a lot pee a lot syndrome is called polyuria polydipsia which just just means drink a lot pee a lot um, that that can be a sign of a whole bunch of health issues, kidney disease, of course, but also liver disease, thyroid, um, diabetes, all kinds of uh, endocrine problems. So if, uh, here's what happened with my, two, I had two old cats, and I went from two or three clumps of pee in the box a day to nine. Mm. So I immediately grabbed a cat and took her in and had blood work. I was in vet school at the time. And I I picked the one I could catch first, and that was Chinook, and she was fine, no problem. And she had always been my big-ticket item cat. She's the one that had hepatic lipidosis. She's the one who had chronic urinary tract stuff. She's the one who had this, that, and the other thing. She had cost me a lot in vet bills, part of why I had to go to vet school myself, you know. you got to <laughs> see some. But it turned out to be the other cat, who was older, but... Um, she was, she was, I think, seven, 17 or 18 at the time. No, she must have been 15. She was 15 at the time. She would rather die than take a pill. So I didn't really treat her, but she was, you know, I didn't give her any medications, but she was on homeopathy for years and everything. She lived another five years. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and she never had problems from it, but I just, I went through more kitty litter as all. So yes. Oh, these things are not death sentences, but you want to know what it is because there are things that can be treated. Thyroid disease is readily treated, and you want to treat it yes. because it is not something you want to let go. Um, that's a really horrible way to die, what happens to those cats. Um, but, you know, liver, uh, endocrine glands, uh, pancreatic, pancreas, you know, pancreatic enzymes or insulin um, kind of body regulation like that. Those are the things that kind of start to poop out when you get older. And, okay. And, you know, appetite, you know, I've noticed with mine, they mostly have gotten a little fussier as, they got, as they've gotten older. And, you know, and, of course, I think when you get a cat, you sign a contract that says, I will spoil this cat to whatever degree necessary. <laughs> so, you know, they, what, what she wants, she gets, you know. Yeah. Um, so... But, you know, if appetite changes, if it increases, that could be thyroid. If it decreases, that can also be thyroid. There, are, there is a thing called um, 
par- paradoxic hyperthyroidism where they actually eat less, lose weight. You know, it's not at all like the the typical, you know, I'm ravenous and I can't keep weight on even though I'm eating 14 pounds of food a day. So um, they're just, there's a number of things, but appetite, wash the litter box, and um, those, you're going to catch most major things that way. Okay. As, I mean, do you get your cat's blood taken once a year after, you know, the age of 10, or do you have any specifications? No, I don't. I, okay. I, I did do baseline blood work on Sundance because he had to have a dental and it actually picked up early kidney failure. That was three or four years ago. And um, he really doesn't show any signs of it. But I had his blood drawn last week and I, or last year, and I probably will do it again soon because we do have some other issues. He's got a calcium imbalance problem that he's had for years that's kind of cropped up again as he's gotten older. So, you know, unless there's symptoms or unless you're watching something like thyroid, if you're, if you're on the medication for thyroid or the diet for thyroid, um, you've got to check it every six months at least because okay. you need to know what, that, what those levels are. Right. But with him, you know, I, you know, I check him because he, he's losing a little weight, so I checked him last year for thyroid. He was fine, but I'm going to check him again this year. It just makes sense because I can't see. I don't have the x-ray eyes to see what's going on in there, and I want to make sure that there's not something that's going to come and, you know, whack me over the head uh, right. in, in shock, you know. So I think it's justified to do at least a basic blood panel with thyroid and probably a year analysis once a year. Okay. Once, you know, when they hit maybe 14, 15, for sure. Okay. All right. Um, and your analysis, uh, my vet always does that basically to check kidney values. Is there something else that they're checking that I'm not aware of? Oh, yeah. If they're doing a basic metabolic panel, you're checking kidneys, you're checking liver, um, thyroid is a separate test, but they will always run it on a cat over 7 to 10 years old because they don't get it before that, but a lot of them get it after that. Um, and there's all the electrolytes, and the, you're checking the immune system with a complete blood count. Um, oh, no, I meant with the urinalysis. Sorry. Oh, urinalysis. Um, yes, when they, when they urinalysis. check the urine. Well, because, yes, because well, you want to check and make sure the... Um, kidneys are working correctly, which means they're concentrating urine, so you right. want to check specific gravity. Um, if you do a blood test and the kidney values come back a little high, and BUN can actually be quite high depending on the diet when they last ate. It goes up and down all the time. But without a urinalysis to go with that blood work, you really can't say whether the cat is having kidney problems or not because a cat could be really dehydrated because it was a long ride in the car on a hot day um, and BUN will be sky high, but the kidneys okay. will be fine. And the only way you know that is to check the urinalysis to see if the kidneys are concentrating the urine. Okay. So there's not, in my book, it, there's not a whole lot of value in doing blood work without a urinalysis in an older kitty. Okay. That's good info. Um, it'll make me n- not hesitate to <laughs> say no to it. Um, yeah, because it's, yeah. It, you really want to do it. If you're going to bother, just, you know, get the whole tamale. Got it. All right, so what can you do to help your senior cat? And I assume, I'm obviously the blood work and the urinalysis and all that stuff when it comes to vets, but in a home life situation is I think where I also was, targeting this question yeah well you, you're paying attention but you know I, I spoil them more as they get older um, you know I make sure the water's fresh I make sure they're eating correctly you know or you know if I you know like he was eating this food last week but now he's like not interested at all so mm-hmm. we have to rotate all the time and and try different things um you know, and, and make sure that they're still active 
that they can move around, that they're still willing to play. Um, I found an old laser pointer the other day, and uh, and Boy Sundance was just all about it, just the same way he was when he was six months old. So, you know, he pooped out a lot sooner than he did back then, but, um, you know, I was happy to see he was still willing to run and pounce and do things like that. Yes. The other thing, I made this mistake, and I feel bad about it to this day. Um, my cat Flynn, his, some of his toenails got really long, and I thought I was trimming them often, but I guess it was a month or so, or maybe a little bit longer. But, you know, a couple of them were really grown, and they, as they get older, they don't take quite as good care of themselves, and they don't chew those husks off, the dead husks off the nail. Mm. So especially, you know, they'll, and they grow, they seem to grow a lot faster in the old cats. I call them old man toenails and old, old lady toenails because they are fierce, you know, they are just massive. And mm. so keeping those trimmed is just extremely important. And I really felt bad that I let Flynn um, go so long that he was starting to have that problem. It was like, oh, shoot, you know, that yeah. was... And, you know, it wasn't that I didn't check them, but I hadn't checked them enough, not often enough. Yes. Hmm. So that is that is certainly something. Um, and, uh, you know, ask, ask your peeps to let you know what they notice. If, if they've always trimmed them once a month or something, see if they, they need it more often. It would be nice to do a little survey and, and get feedback on that because my perception is that they grow faster or they're not, you know, or they're allowing them to grow faster because they're not maintaining them. You know how they, you know, they'll get their back foot in their mouth and just wiggle it and worry it and chomp on it. And that's, they're actually taking those dead layers off themselves. But when they quit doing that, then you got a real problem. Okay. That's interesting. A, a lot of people, well, so I've been working with this company called Zen Clipper and they make a conical blade um, clipper that fits right over the, the claw. And anyway, in, in talking about it on social media and stuff, I've found a lot of people aren't aware of how a cat's claws grow, that they grow in layers and that they peel off kind of like an onion when they scratch. Um, but somebody did mention just the other day that um, her cats had gotten older and that the nails had gotten, you know, thicker and coarser. Um, yeah. So, yeah. yes. Absolutely. And I don't know if it's the cat's inattention to them or ours that's the problem, but it's something we really need to step up our game because, you know, I saw it all the time with older kitties. I just, but I didn't know how those people were dealing with them, but I know how I was dealing with my own cat. And I thought I was paying attention and clearly not enough. Right. Well, that's, that's good advice because I, I don't clip my cat's nails on a regular basis other than because people have asked me, certainly, you know, how often should I clip my cat's nails? And I, I say, well, it, to me it's kind of like a human. You know, my mom couldn't cut all of my siblings' nails at the same time because we all have different genetics. I mean, we're similar because we're all from her. But, right. Um, you, you metabolize just slightly different. Yes, and what we're eating, obviously, is going to change how fast our nails and hair grow. So, yes, all of that came into play, but um, I usually just do mine when they're kneading on me, and I'm like, ow, ow. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> time, time to cut our claws. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and that didn't happen with Flynn, so that's why, why it really took oh. me Oh, okay. Well, then I guess yeah. I'm... I'm fortunate that both of mine do that so that I be aware. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, and, and uh, Flynn had very furry feet, very, oh. very heavy fur. Yeah. And, um, and he did not like having his feet handled particularly. But, you know, but he didn't, um, he didn't nail me with them, and that was the odd thing. Yeah. So, you know, you think you'd notice, but I didn't notice. So, yeah. Okay. It's one of those little quirks of life. Yes. Well, so I am on the phone with you, but I'm staring at litter boxes, and I know that um, there comes a point in time, like if you have 
a high peeing cat, for example, um, and you have a litter. I, I'm thinking of my parents' cats when I'm saying this because they both stand and pee. They don't squat. Right. And, right. Um, so she's got the storage bins, and I've been saying, Mom, these storage bins aren't going to work forever. They're, they'll be 14 this year, and they're not going to be able to jump in and out. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah. The way I solved that was I just put a little step stool next to the box and kept uh, the litter really deep, so it was less space that they had to jump back out. Um, okay. And that worked for a long time. But one thing I've noticed with some older cats is they do not like deep litter, especially if they have old crickety knees. They d- they're not going to squat as much as they have in the past if they ever did. Um, and it's going to be more of a issue to get in and out of there. But what they don't like is if their feet sink way down into soft litter, it makes them feel unsteady. So sometimes with the older guys, you can only put in just a very thin layer of litter, you know, just enough to absorb whatever they're going to use up in a day, and you just have to keep up with it a little better. So, you know, if your cat is objecting to the litter and, and it's, always deep and you haven't changed it, but suddenly they're not doing it anymore, regardless of the height of the size of the box. You know, that's something to try, is try less litter. You know, I would have thought that, you know, for an older cat you'd put more litter so it's more cushiony. Not all cats appreciate that. Okay. So, you know, and I, I did live with tarps and newspapers all over my house for a year and a half when my cats go to old you know, it's like I'm not the one, you know, I'm the one who has to change because they're not going to change. Right. You know, but, yes. um, you know, and probably people think that is just crazy, but this is what you do for your kitties. Um, one thing that's really important with the older kitties is to have a litter box on every level of the house. If you live in a five-story mansion, you got to have a little box on each level because one of these days your cat's going to say, you know, I don't feel like going to the basement. Here's a nice spot right here, and now you have a problem. Right. So, you know, I, I don't want them going up and downstairs a lot, um, you know, because it's, it's hard on them, and eventually they will quit doing it. And so yes. you want to kind of head that off at the path. And I have friends and clients that just... I don't want a litter box on the main level. I said, well, you'd rather have cat pee? Be my guest. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the other the other thing with the like the Rubbermaid tubs that you use, you can you can cut out. They're they're actually very pliable with a you know with a box a Dremel. cutter. You can, oh. A, with any kind of a sharp instrument, you can carve a doorway out of it. You know now there's always a chance that the cat's going to back up to the doorway and, and right. shoot out. But right. you, you, make, you make an entrance somewhere that, uh, that they can just kind of walk in. And they do make walk-in litter boxes and shall, really shallow ones uh, for dogs. And those are really great if your cat does squat. But like, like you found out and I have found out that they are not always going to squat and the day that they don't is the day you're going to have to find a new solution yes yes i am blessed knock on wood that mine are squatters um yeah (laughs) the cat that i grew up with squat too so my mom was like where did these two come from um yeah their their mama didn't teach them right i guess not Well, speaking about that litter box on every floor, when Rags was um, in his final years, I consulted with an animal communicator several times, and one of the requests that he had was um, for me to add night lights that he couldn't see as well at night anymore. That's really a great idea, yeah. And I did find that he um, seemed to move around more at night after I added those. That's to your suggestion with the step stool into the litter box, I had a step stool up to a chair up to my bed. <laughs> so, right. So he didn't right. have to jump up on my bed. Right. Um, and uh, you know, Sundance has had, you know, because the, Sundance is three years older than the other older cats. So I had put a chair for them to climb up onto the bed f- for several yes. years. And he utilizes it 
to jump up, but not always down, which bothers me. But, um, you know, you can't make them. Right, exactly. But I, I could tell that Rags appreciated it once I, you know, taught him, this is why I have a chair butted up next to the bed. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is funny how you start just accepting living in a different way um, for the yeah. comfort of your kitty. Exactly. And, you know, as as we get older, we need to stay flexible in our minds and our habits. And uh, living with an older cat is a really good way to test how that's going. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So before I move into the reader questions, um, was there anything else that you wanted to add to what can you do to help your senior cat? Well, just lots of cuddles. And because they don't groom as well, you know, increased attention to keeping their coat not free and everything. Um, you know, just more TLC. I figure if they've been around this long, they've really earned it. Absolutely. What is your take on the whole um, bathing a cat thing? And I'm asking that because I get that question quite frequently, and my response is always um, the only time I've ever needed to bathe a cat is when they've had a you know, serious diarrhea problem or they were old and, and their, cat, their coat was getting, like, greasy. But other than that, yeah. I don't really do it. Yeah, I've never bathed mine. And... Um the last of the last four, only one of them was short haired. So, um, oh. and Puzzle and Flynn had that really uh, baby fine kind of kinky hair that was just miserable to deal with. <laughs> and um, but they both enjoyed being brushed. But the big thing to know about bathing cats is you have to comb out everything before you bathe them because if those knots get wet you are in serious world of hurt. Okay. And but unless unless they go outside and get into stuff or, you know, have a an issue, um I I don't recommend bathing them. Right. You know, I think if they're looking a little greasy, that is actually probably a sign that they need more good fatty acids in their diet. Oh. Cuz yeah. Yeah, it just is would... completely it's completely counterintuitive, but apparently the the quality of fats in the food that they're eating is probably not as good as what they actually need at that point. Okay. So um, you want, might want to consider um, fish oil and things like that at that point. Okay. Interesting. Well, I failed rags in that regard. Instead, I was like, let's go get this grease out of your coat. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I always thought that, but then it never stayed. I always, uh, Puzzle and Flynn loved to be shaved in the summer. And it didn't matter that they grew back the same way, mm. and regardless of what I was feeding, what I was doing. It didn't matter. And that was it was more genetic, I think, with them. But, you know, I did up their asses, but, it, you know, I, there's such a big genetic component. And, and they are not grooming as well as they get older. You know, so increased brushing is probably a good thing. Okay. All right. Well, so I got, when I posted it on Facebook that we were going to have a talk, um, I people left comments underneath that post, and then I also got an email from a reader. So I thought I'd first hit the questions from the Facebook post um, and then get into the email one because it's more, there's more questions on that one. Okay. So Janelle asked um, how to reduce stress associated with trips in the carrier. Mm-hmm. Zoe, age 10, recently started hyperventilating and drooling on trips to the vet. Oh, that's a good one. Um, flower essences are so good for that. Um, something like Stress Stopper or uh, Rescue Remedy, those are really helpful. And if you know you're going to the vet and it's not just the last, we better go, then I would start several days ahead um, setting them up with with the flower essences, spray the inside of the carrier, spray the inside of the car. It's like putting happy juice in the air. Um, And and that has made a big, big difference. And, you know, when you get into the room at the vet, 
you know, have a little spritzer bottle with you and spray around the room, and, you know, that'll, that'll help. Um, you know, you can always try the desensitization, put them in the carrier, take them out the door, bring them right back, let them out, and put them in the carrier, take them to the car, walk back in, let them out, take them to the car, put them in the back of the car, close the door, open the door, take them back. You know, little little steps to get them accustomed to it. Um, but, you know, really, if you're only going to be going to the vet once or twice a year, it's probably not worth the hassle, and they will forget by the next time. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, and there are herbal formulas that are real good for stress, and and those can be given, you know, an hour or two ahead. Um, I know a lot of vets now are recommending gabapentin. Um, mm-hmm. I suppose I suppose one dose isn't going to bad story. I personally was having a really bad day. I was over at a friend's house, and we were we were out in the garden. Try, I, I was trying to de-stress from my job, and she said, here, take one of these. And she gave me, a, I think, 100 milligrams of Neurontin, which is the brand name of Gabapin. She says, it just turns, turns it down a little bit. You won't feel any different, but the upper layer of stress will be gone, and it works so well. So it's not a drug you want your cat on for long periods of time, but I think a judicious... Uh, dose for those occasions probably not a bad thing. Okay. You know, it, the side effects are rare, and um, you know, it, the, the the side effects of having that much stress, I think, far outweigh the possible worries with using a, a medication. The one thing you should not give is ACE promazine. ACE will will slow them down. But then they're still scared, and they can't fully to it. So I forgot to turn the do not disturb sign on. Sorry. That's okay. (laughs) Um, Okay. So on the that's good to. I'm glad to hear that from you about Gavin Panton because my vet has uh, requested that for Charlie when he comes in and. I just don't want to give it to him, so I, because I, I don't want to give him a drug, um, and so yeah. I said, "Well, can I just give him some cannabis? <laughs> See how that goes?" Um, no. Okay. Absolutely not, because the, the well, unless you really know what you're doing and what you have, but right. No, this is like feline, <laughs> like made for feline cannabis, yeah. not right, not a bag I bought off the street. No. I would yeah. never, ever do that. The stuff in the dispensaries is so strong. You would not. Right. THC is deadly for cats right. and dogs. No, yeah. This is can of companion. The fine, but, uh, but you really want to know what you're doing with it and how much, um, you know, what dose you're giving. If you're giving it by mouth, you've got to know that it takes a couple of hours to kick in. Um, there's a particular product I use and like. But um, it does help with stress, but I think it helps more with chronic stress than acute stress. Okay, that makes I'm sense. I'm not sure it's going to turn them down. Okay. But, you know, just like a volume knob. Gabapentin does seem to do that. Um, okay. Valium is, you can use, it's kind of out of vogue. Um, and, and you really, but when you, want, when you get to the vet, you want the cat to to be feeling okay and acting fairly normal. So, you know, because otherwise, I mean, I (laughs) I walked into an exam one one day and the cat was absolutely flat out on the table. (laughs) Flat as a pancake, like all four feet stuck out, just like he had been poured like a pancake onto the table. (laughs) I, I about pooped a brick and I looked down at the chart and it said annual exam. I'm like... (laughs) <laughs> what happened to the cat? He goes, oh, I gave him rescue remedy. <laughs> that was just, I have never seen a cat so flat in my entire life. <laughs> so, you know, these alternative treatments can can work very well, and herbs, I think, work as well or better than uh, than most drugs. So there are, okay. there are lots of choices. 
I'm not sure I count on CBD in the moment, although it does it it can work very fast um, if it's used right. But it just doesn't strike me as being the grandest thing to use. Okay. All right, that that's fair. Um, and unless you've been using it for a while, um, and and the cat is used to it. Okay. You know, in which case, the stress level will already be turned down in general. Right. Okay. Um, wh- what about the CBD oil and stuff like that? When you mentioned, um, f- I would think for geriatric cats, uh, does it help with arthritis or any other issues that they get? It does. Now, it's probably illegal to talk about drug effects from a herbal supplement. Right, um, right, yeah. But it's um it is really good for pain. Okay. Yeah. Yes, my my vet has said that they are recommending regularly the CBD oil for more of their hospice type cats. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Because it does reduce stress and anxiety and it does reduce pain and it's you know, it's that happy juice kind of thing. Right. But, yes, they say the same thing. We can't make any claims that it does any of this stuff. We just right. have right. seen other patients do well on it. Right. Um, Especially because I happen to be, you know, I'm a, technically a distributor for this particular kind, so I won't say what that is. But um, I suppose you could probably find it on my website. But... Um, <laughs> But that's, you know, I worked with FDA for 20 years, and I don't want to come crashing down on my head, you know. Yes. I don't like those guys, you know. I don't want to annoy them. But, um, yeah, it's it's good for so many things. And the way that it works, it works right at the nerve endings, and it it affects how excitatory versus inhibitory neurotransmitters are released. So it's it's... It can be very precise, cool. and it and it has effects all over the body. And but there's, you know, I mean, we could I could go on for hours about, you know, what it does and how it works physiologically. But you don't need to know that right now. <laughs> well, but, and, yeah, and you I, probably lose I, me anyway. Great. I use it, so um, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I will be able to link to that from our. Interview. Possibly. There's, you know, you can do a lot with technology these days. Yes, yes. All right. Well, Janelle's second question was, um, how much weight loss is is acceptable? Man, I am tongue-tied today. Um, does she have recommendations for maintaining weight in active, otherwise healthy older cats? If they're healthy, they shouldn't be losing much weight, but... Um, like Sundance lost a pound in a year, I could tell. You know, if they lose weight to where it's noticeable, I think that needs to be checked. You know, I'd say a pound in, in even three or four months would be serious. A pound in six months would be worth checking. A pound in a year, I'm keeping an eye on it. Because okay. it, tends, it tends to accelerate. And it doesn't... It's called skinny old cat syndrome, and nobody knows why they lose weight as they get older, but they do. And But some cats lose weight catastrophically and dramatically as they get older. Now, Flynn did that. He wasted away to nothing, and he lived another two, three years, ate like a pig. Thyroid was perfect, you know? Yeah. It was just that was his genetics. Right. Okay. Well, and again, I would think that um, if you're having them regularly checked by a vet, that is most helpful. Yeah. Um, of course, yeah, a not, pound off of a back, what? Sorry. A pound off of a eight pound cat versus a pound off of a fifteen pound cat is a big difference. So it that's is. why but either one. I, yeah, I mean, a, a pound in an eight pound cat is gonna gonna be obvious much quicker, but you know. Yeah. A pound in a 15-pound cat is ser- still serious, you know, because a 15-pound rag doll is not too fat, 
you know, that's not a huge right. thing. So if you're losing weight in a normal weight cat, you know, that's that's the thing. Sundance used to be 12 pounds at his highest. Now he's 10, you know, but he's 17. So, you know, I'm, I just keep a close eye on him. One thing, well, two things. Let's insert here. One is older cats probably should go to the vet every six months. Okay. Just make sure you're catching things early. Your vet's going to palpate the tummy and is going to be able to recognize if there's thickening or masses or little something a little funkinated in there. Um, but older cats should not be vaccinated, period, for anything, ever. I stopped vaccinate. I used to stop vaccinating at 14. If I had to do it again, I'd stop at 12 at the outside and only rabies because there's nothing else they're going to get. Okay. Rabies is required by law. And the other thing with kitties, I know we've talked about vaccination, but the other thing to really be aware of is for all the kitty vaccines, there are non-adjuvanted recombinant vaccines from Mariel and use those or the intranasal okay. or whatever you have. No killed viruses, so no killed rabies virus, no FIV, no FELV, no FIP. Those are all killed vaccines. You don't want them. Okay. Killed vaccines give cancer to cats. Right. At a, at, you know, as many as one in a thousand. And if we have, you know, 80 million cats, that's hundreds of thousands of cats. You know, right. that's way too much cancer. Right. I will link to our um, interview about vaccinations, too, so yeah. if okay, someone good. wants to read more or listen more, they can. Yeah. Um, sorry, that deep breath was for uh, I, the anger I have around that whole situation. Oh, anyway. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Moving right along. Um, Julie asked, uh, my two raggies, age 10 and 12, both have dreadful hair slash fur ball coughs. Advice would be appreciated. Well, are you sure it's hair balls and not asthma? They sound pretty identical. Although okay. Although you usually have two cats with asthma. Um, I use plain Vaseline as a hair ball fixer. And I would say to give, you know, a you stick your finger in the jar and you get a chunk and you smush it between their teeth. I would do that once a day for four or five days and see if that doesn't improve things. I I like Vaseline and petroleum jelly. Everybody has a heart attack when I say that. It is completely inert in the body. It cannot be broken down. You can give vegetable oil all day, but it's not going to last past the small intestine. And you don't want them getting the blockage lower down. So... Um, it's completely inert, so it stays with, you know, it gloms up the hair and whizzes out the back door, all you know, just in one fell swoop, and it works extremely well. Um, and that's a good way to tell them apart, a hairball cough versus something else. Okay. Okay. I had, my, I guess, I can't tell me the best brand tastes better than other brands, but you can do what you want. But, you know, there are, there's laxatone and Cadillacs and all those with flavors and a bunch of junk in them. I, I just prefer plain petroleum jelly. Okay. My cat spirit ate it every day as she got older two or three times a day because she adored it uh, for 20 years. And oh, wow. She lived 20 years, so it was not hurting her. Right. Um, I had quite the visual when you said it tastes the best. I had you uh, pictured you in front of a table with, you know, four or five jars lined up, <laughs> taking a bite out of each. Um, I had thought that it might have to do with what they're eating if they were on dry food only, and I had sent her to catinfo.org, and she had found out otherwise. So is there any relationship to that at all? Probably. Okay. It probably is because dry food is so hard on them, and it's, you know, if they're just used to to dry food, it's like 
being on a Frito Twinkie diet, and your guts just aren't going to work as well as they should. But you're talking ragdolls. These are long-haired cats, and there's just a lot of fur to process. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Renee asked, uh, we have stairs that go we have stairs that she goes up and down throughout the day. She's 15. Sometimes fast, other times a bit slow. Should I worry that it's hard for her? Um, yeah. I mean, I, if she's going up slowly because of pain, yeah. So, but I don't know what you can do to stop her other than baby gate at the top and the bottom and hope she doesn't decide to jump it, which would right. be worse. Um, it it kind of depends on why she's doing that. And, if you know, if there's doors upstairs, close all the doors, and maybe upstairs will be less attractive to her, you know. Okay. But it is not doing her any good to push through pain. If, it's, if it hurts, she should stop, but you can't tell them. So, you know we have to kind of think, well, what could be, you know, what could be going on there and why is she doing it? And, um, yeah, I would I would restrict her a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can always treat the arthritis, you know, laser, acupuncture, herbs, all, homeopathy all work really well. But then you don't want her running up and down the stairs because she feels good because the pain is masked, you know. Right. Right. Okay. And, th- and those situations are so individual, um, it would be hard to make a blanket statement, I would think. Yeah. It's just, you know, I try and minimize the jumping up and down with, you know, chairs, steps, boxes, whatever, um, stools, you know, and just give them an alternative way. But there's not really an alternate route to stairs unless you want to install an elevator, try to teach, teach the cat how to use it. Maybe if you put in a little tiny elevator. <laughs> With the pulley system, right? yes. Yeah, maybe it's a dumb weight or something like that, yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Um, the last one on that Facebook post was from Rose and she said, is there a way to prevent pillow foot, which my last raggy was diagnosed with? Is it common with aging kitties? I don't even know what pillow foot is. It's um, podocell, uh, plasma cell pod- okay, let me, pododermatitis, okay. Oh, I got my mouth to work. That is an, uh, auto, that's an autoimmune disease, oh. and it's, it's not common at all. I never saw it in 20 years of of uh, practice, mm. and uh, I I would certainly say don't vaccinate, you know, don't over-vaccinate because that's where you get autoimmune diseases. Mm. There's been papers, at least two papers, that have said that vaccination causes autoimmune disease, period. It is inevitable. They will cause a problem, so... Um, that's, you know, it's the intermixture of, of environmental insult and genetics. You know, and okay. if, you happen to, if you happen to have a cat with a weak spot in the genetics and you give the vaccine that's got, you know, what vaccines do, you, well, we've already talked about vaccines, but it's not just the vaccine in that, in that syringe. It's all kinds of proteins. And if the proteins match the proteins in your cat, it, auto antibodies will be formed to them and react with your cat. So, yeah. Okay. So that's, it's, it's, yeah, it's very rare in my experience. Well, I need to Google it because I haven't even um, looked it up yet. Okay. Well, and I, I hope I never have to encounter it myself. I never have to because it, it's got to be very unpleasant. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, Karen wrote an email, so excited about our interview, and she had a number of questions. Um, Her first one was, large breed cats and lifespan. Generally speaking, with the canine, smaller breeds tend to live a longer lifespan. How does, quote, unquote, size impact the feline world? Um, Ragdolls being a large breed of cat, should we equate feline's life expectancies to the breed size? 
Um, she goes on to say the handful of domestic feline breeds, including ragdolls, that widely recognize the main character trait specific to the breed, being this kind of cat is a kitty of size. Does this large body structure have an impact on life expectancy? It's a kind of the same question, so I'll stop. Um, I haven't noticed that or heard that um, because the difference is only really a few pounds. Right. You know, it, you you know, you go from a two pound Chihuahua to a hundred and eighty pound, uh, you know, Malamute or something. That's that's a vast difference, and they grow at different rates. It's the problem that big dogs have um, is they get can- bone cancer because mm-hmm. they've been bred to build bone really fast, and some of those fast bone growing cells stick around and they they keep going, and they get they tend to get osteosarcoma um, and heart problems because the heart's not designed to handle that kind of uh, load. But uh, I haven't seen that in cats, except I will say that the cats I've known that have gone to 20, 22, 23 years have all been small, petite cats, when mm-hmm. I think about it. Yeah, but, I, but they've mostly been really opinionated, crotchety cats, too. It's like only the good die young, right? But the mm-hmm. stubborn ones live forever. So it, I think it may be personality related more than anything. Right. <laughs> Uh, yes, I, I have several jokes I want to say, but I need to be appropriate, so I won't. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we could go off on a tangent right there. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, number two, the information is fairly common regarding aging large breed dogs and specific geriatric elements they often develop. Conditions not nurse. Ne- conditions not necessarily seen as quickly or as severe in small toy breeds. This, uh, my guess is Karen is very knowledgeable about dogs. Um, are the large breed cats more often susceptible to particular genetic conditions that is less prominent than those in smaller cat breeds? No. Okay. And you kind of covered that with the pound difference earlier, but. Yeah. So some cat breeds are more prone to certain conditions than other cat breeds, you know, just right. because, that's, you know, that's a genetic monkey business with, but it's not a size related. Okay. Um, Number three, geriatric proactive care. We've kind of covered this, but maybe just to make it more um, crystal clear, blood testing and profile and baseline, when, why should we get lab work uh, workup done on our healthy or normal appearing kitty? Please inform people of the useful lab information you collect on file and how it's beneficial to health plans of our kitty in later years while aging or facing illnesses. I did. We didn't talk about that. The the importance of getting a baseline when they are at, at their normal, healthy. Yeah, and I'm not a hundred percent that it's that useful if they're okay. normal, because okay. then the blood work would be normal. But if you have a 15 or 16 year old cat, the purpose of a baseline in my book would be um, to make sure there's not something going on. If it's normal, that's great. But you really want to be able to catch things early, and that's why you do blood work. Okay. But, you know, and and it depends on the cat, uh, you know, whether, you know, and, of course, the a lot of cats at that age need dental care, and they're going to run blood work before they do that to make sure they're safe for anesthesia. So all of that kind of works hand in hand. But I wouldn't take a healthy 12-year-old old just for blood work for just to get a baseline because, if you draw it, uh, here's 10 past 1 here. If you draw it now and you draw it at 4 o'clock and you draw it at midnight, they're all going to be different. Mm. So, you know, it's blood work is is just a snapshot. And right. it doesn't do a whole picture. But it will tell you trends. Okay. And trends are, are what you want to stay on top of. Okay. All right. Uh Number four, I, I don't know. I sent you this list already, but um, I'm yeah, skipping I, around. Yeah. Um, I'm skipping to when you're – I'm going to keep the euthanasia one to the last one. Um, when your elderly cat hides unusually, what messages is your pet trying to tell you? They don't feel good. Get okay. Them to that. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, cats, I love them so much, but they can't text you. They can't leave a post-it note on the fridge. They can't, you know, they communicate with body language and behavior and pee and poop. And those are the things you want to be watching. And if any of those change, and especially uh, changes around litter box habits, if they, you know, they've been fine forever and all of a sudden now they're peeing somewhere unusual or pooping somewhere unusual, something's going on. So either something's going on with the litter box, there's some, you know, it, something happened when they were there or their arthritis has gotten bad enough that they don't feel as comfortable going there and it would be it's so much softer on your bed. And, um, you know, those are all SOS, red flag signals. Okay. Um, it's not because they're mad. It's not because they're annoyed. It's not revenge. It is a cry for help every single time. So if they're hiding, the, you know, wild animals, go off by themselves when they're sick. Right. And our cats are still very, very close to that wild cat. In fact, I've read papers that say, well, we're not really entirely sure that cats are domesticated completely, <laughs> you know. So, right. um, yeah, I, yeah, changes in behavior in an older cat absolutely get them checked out. Okay. And your, your vet will be able to look at the cat feel things and assess the code and ask you about appetite and all these other things. And you can put together a pretty good picture of what's really going on. Okay. Um, so quality of life, um, we kind of touched on this before, but changes we can make in the living environment to accommodate a geriatric cat. We talked about litter box, but she mentioned two things that we didn't talk about. Um, uh, a lot of people ask me about heated cat beds, and then she also asked about dishes. Do you have any say on either one of those? Yes. Um, I was feeding them on the kitchen table because I never use it. So they had a spot. You know, it was in the sun, and they had plants right there. It was a very charming little breakfast nook for them. Yes. Um, but as they got older, they were having trouble getting up and down, jumping on the chair, jumping on the table. So I... I moved them all to the floor, so everything went to the floor. And in a place where I see it and I can monitor it all the time, it's right. I have to trip over it to get from one end of the house to the other. So it, it's it's a good way to monitor things. Um, and she said heat. I when when my cats got old, I did bite the bullet and pay a lot more on my utility bill to keep the house at a warmer temperature. Mm. I'm cold all the time, but I wouldn't do it just for me, but I would do it for the cat. Right. And it was expensive, but, you know, I wanted them to be comfortable, you know. Um, I did, if I, well, yeah, you can do, you can do this. I had bought an electric mattress pad, so the bed is always warm. Mm-hmm. And I I leave it on all the time, pretty much year round, because when they get old, they want heat. But I discovered this other wonderful thing. It's called a self-heating cat bed. I don't know. It has some kind of reflective, probably mylar, uh, in the lining that reflects the heat, holds the heat in. And as soon as the, he didn't he, he didn't want to touch that for a long time, but until I put it in a really good spot. And right. now he's in it all the time. I finally I put it in a window that gets some sun in the morning, and he's like, oh, you finally got the hint. Thank you very much. So <laughs> that's, that's where he is, and he really enjoys that. So it, obviously he feels a difference between that and the bed that was there before because he, he was not that dedicated to it. Yes. That, that's cute. I, when you, how you said it verbally made me see him like stretching in it. Um, so yes, I, I found that once you, it, sometimes it doesn't necessarily matter about the bed. It's more the placement of it. <laughs> yeah, that matters. So so you know they could sleep anywhere on the bed and it's going to be warm, right? You know. Yes. <laughs> cute. Okay. Um, food <laughs> he's stuff. Good, he's 
got a new habit too. I have an electric throw that I use when I'm in my recliner, you know, reading or watching TV or whatever. And he does not get under the covers. But he really wanted, when we got a cold snap, he wanted to be under the covers. So I have to prop my knees up, make a little tent, so there's a cave for him to go into. And he'll go in there and, God forbid, I should have to go to the bathroom or anything because he will sit there for hours on end. And it's so unusual for him to be that heat-seeking. So now I really make sure that I accommodate him. You know, it's, uh, yeah, we have to change our habits when they get old. That's all there is to it. Yes. Oh, cute. Uh, okay, food stuff, new diet requirements, good texture and temperature, vitamins and supplements when being proactive, medicine from a vet to help comfort pet is what she has written down. Yeah. Well, that's a mouthful. It, um, yes. Yeah. I mean, the food, of course, is such an individual preference. You know, some cats will only eat uh, shreds with gravy and some will only eat pate and some will only eat, you know, whatever, lasagna, um, Garfield and Spirit. Spirit really loves lasagna. Um, But, yeah, I mean, you just try different things and you you figure out which ones are their favorites and those are the ones you get, you know. And I don't give him the same thing twice in a row. I go through several cans a day. (laughs) The other day I... Forgot to do dishes one day. I didn't feel good, and I left it for the next day. I went through all eight of my uh, little bread plates that I feed him on mm-hmm. um, in two days. Wow. So that's how often he was getting fed. You know, I work from home. I, I have the luxury of doing that. I made sure that, you know, whenever it, whenever he gave me that look or swat, swatted me across the face, it's like, oh, okay, I need to do something about your food. And, uh, you know, but I, I feed him a lot more often in smaller portions because that's that's the habit that he's he's most comfortable with at this point. You know, he doesn't eat till he gets full. He's not like that. Um, but if there's not anything there, boy, he's going to let me know because just right. in case he gets hungry. Um, and, you know, temperature and texture is an individual thing. I do try and warm it up. I have an electric kettle, and I always pour a little bit of uh, warm water in with the food, kind of regardless of season or anything, just because I think it smells better if it's a little warm. Right. And he seems to like it that way. Um, vitamins and supplements, I recommend four. Um, omega-3 fatty acids, probiotics, digestive enzymes, and extra antioxidants. And I would put them in that order. And do you have brand or source information for that kind of stuff that you can send me and I can link to it? Yeah, there's a lot of information on my website, so I'll send you links to that. Okay, perfect. Because I know people Um, are always asking me about probiotics and brands, and I I use 4-4 for... I use the stuff for him him that I get at the health food store for me. Okay. Um, And I use a lot. I give him a well, lot because it can't hurt. Okay. Um, I, well, I've done the same, but my vet didn't tell me to do it, so I can't just say that. <laughs> well, I told you to do it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> do it, Jenny. Just do it. Um, well, yeah. and uh, yes, I there is um, a, a loyal friend and reader of Foppy Cats who is an RN, and I, I said, is there any chance that this can hurt the cat? The cat? And she said no. So, um, yes. That, but still, I think people need um, sometimes a brand recommendation, so I'd like to include that. Yeah. That's, I think I have everything on my website. So. Okay. Yeah. I'll make sure to update if I don't. So, yeah, we okay. can get to that later. All right. And then medicine from a vet, I mean, if they need pain meds, get, get them pain meds. Um, buprenorphine is the best and safest pain med for a cat. It's strong. It's a narcotic, um, so it's not used that often, but it really is is a terrific thing. But if your pet or if your cat needs that level of pain control, then you have to wonder, you know, are are you on the right path? Where are you going? You know, right. what, what's next? So 
but we'll talk about euthanasia in a sec, so okay. we'll leave that for the moment. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's not anything in particular. Oh, I so many people that put so many cats on Fortiflora from mm-hmm. Purina as a probiotic. Mm-hmm. The ingredient, I, I got a free sample from Purina, and I read the ingredients. And even though it was free, and even though I know it tastes good to cats, when I read the ingredients, there was I could not force myself to even try it with him. It was yeah. that vile. Yeah. So get a better probiotic. Yes. Yeah. Yes, unfortunately, I did that for years, and then um, was like, why are you guys kind of scratching all the time? Yeah, I mean, oh. it's, it's like, you know, I, I have to wrap it and use toilet paper to put it down his throat. I'm not going to do that, you know. That's right. just, you know, it was just, it, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And I knew he would like it, you know. And it's such a tiny amount. How can that hurt? I couldn't do it. I just, right. I threw it away. It's like, no, I can't give this to my cat. I can't give this to a friend to give to their cat. This is disgusting, and it belongs in the garbage can. <laughs> Um, but that's how I feel about most things from Purina. Right, so, I know, I know. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we will include links to ones that you support so that we um, have answers for folks that need them. Yeah. Um, and as okay, far as you know, keeping weight on them, you can add, you can add uh, fat, extra fat as calories, but you want to make sure it's the right kind. And... You know, if you have a cat that's really losing weight, you know I hate dry food, but it will get it will help them gain weight. And in yes. a pinch, you know, with Flynn, I let I left the dry food available because I didn't want him to be hungry in the rest of his life for one second. And they didn't need it, you know. Yeah. They didn't need it, but I wanted it to be there just in case. Um, but it will put weight on a cat, so that's an option. You just want to get a really good one. You know, yeah. Um, and so then people are going to ask me what's a really good one. Well, then they can get my book because I name brands. And okay. My list of brands has been pared down tremendously because, you know, everything's been bought by everybody else. The last uh, Blue Buffalo has been bought by, um, who is it? General Mills, I think, or something mm. horrible. Merrick is gone, Neutro's gone, Blue Buffalo's gone. I mean, all the all the brands that I relied on, you know, there are very few left that are that are good. Okay. And if your cat has kidney problems or urinary tract problems, I would still recommend no dry food and diabetics no dry food. But if it's simply a matter of trying to put a little weight on them, yeah, if they'll eat some cookies, fine. You know. Right. That's. Yeah. Okay. You gotta you gotta assess your options and make the choices. It's gonna be different for everyone and every cat. Right. Okay. Um, next one she has is changing changes in behavior, mood, eating habits, litter box differences, and hygiene. We talked about these things, but yeah. if there's anything more that you want to mention, um, then she said, oh, hint. I, I think we covered most of this. Okay. We will move on to kitty dementia. Ah. Yeah, I think they get it. I do. I don't think there's a whole lot we can do for it other than essential fatty acids and choline, which is interesting, but I, I was working with a vet years ago, and he wrote a paper on um, cognitive decline in cats and how it was reversible with choline supplementation. Choline is sort of a B vitamin cousin, distant cousin. Sometimes it, it's called vitamin B4, um, which, you know, if you, you can look it up. That's what, they, that's what it is. But um, I hadn't heard that until I actually looked. When somebody said, B4, you need more B4. So I so, said, so what? Um, you can get it from certain foods, but it, they're not necessarily foods that are common in the standard American diet, which is the basis for most pet foods. But I think a cat that's on a high-quality canned or homemade or raw food is probably getting plenty. 
Um, but extracholine is something to consider, and, and the DHA part of the EPA, DHA, is critical for um, brain. Mm. Some 40% of the fat in the brain is DHA, so you want to kind of really overdo it even a little bit with the, with the fatty acids. Um, okay. And, you know, there are ways to keep the mind active. You know, keep playing with them. You know, mm. hide things, food puzzle toys, those kind of things. You know, those are, uh, keep the cat interested in life. You know, put a bird feeder outside your window or, you know, get the kitty TV program on your, you know, on your DVR and run it. Um, just keep them interested. If they're interested in things, they're using their brain. If they're yes. using their brain, they're less likely to have cognitive problems later on. Okay. That's a good point that you brought up about playing with them as they age as well. Uh, yeah, and I, had, I don't do it enough, but it, he he still loves it, you know. Yeah. It's still really interesting. Yes. All right, well, then that brings us to <clears throat> euthanasia. And um, Karen had asked what to expect for them and what we and what we see, how fast the medication works, where... Where it will be performed, I'm guessing she's asking about home or uh, vet office. What to ask, options available, preparing well in advance for your vet clinic staff to be clear what your wishes are, the grief process, grieving children, grieving companion pets, how we can help remaining pets. Mm, all good questions. Yes. Um, it, it will vary. The procedure will vary. Um, I was really a fan of doing intraperitoneal injections. Um, where you you don't put it in a vein. If you if you put an IV and you inject into the vein, they go immediately, within seconds. But I kind of feel like sometimes that's kind of like giving them the bum's rush. It's like get out of here. Right. And it's it's a little abrupt, and it's it's fine for dogs. Dogs don't seem to. It's diff- their energy is different, and I think dogs are cooler with that stuff. But um, and they and you can't do an IP on a dog, so um, but you can in a cat, and that just is injecting it into the abdomen. Um, a lot of times you'll shoot for the liver or a kidney, and so it gets into the bloodstream faster. But I, and I've had cats before the instant the needle went in, they just bailed. They said, thanks, that was the permission I needed, bye-bye. Uh, I've, had, I've had it take an hour and a half, and, but I let the cat decide how fast they want to go. I give them the injection, and it will get soaked up into the bloodstream from the tissues in the abdomen, and eventually it reaches the level where it stops the heart. Um, and that, to me, is just... a, a it seems a little more civilized to me, you know, that the, that I'm not saying get out of here right now, and it, it gives um, the family some time to say, you know, because if you give the injection, they're gone. There, there's not time to process that. So I like it to take a little bit longer, which is, maybe that's, maybe I'm just twisted sister here, but um, it just seems to be a much more pleasant experience for everybody to do it that way and not everybody even knows how to how to do it or why to do it or has ever done it um there was just a i saw something about intercardiac stick or a heart stick we call it that is injecting directly in the heart you never ever ever do that on an awake animal mm. if they're already anesthetized yes yeah. but it is extremely painful and mm. you don't want to do it so if if your vet even hints around that they can do that, that that's absolutely improper. It's against the AVMA's recommendations and all that stuff. Um, so it can take a while depending on how they do it. Um, the medication is an overdose of barbiturate. Uh, it probably most cats need about one milliliter. Um, we always give three or four just because we want to make sure, right? You know, 
we don't want to, we don't, I've never had one wake up on me, thank God, but, um, you know, if you were, uh, if you were rationing your, your supply, that's not the place to do it. Um, I much prefer doing that at home. I have done a lot of home euthanasias, and it is so much nicer for the pet. It's not always going to be possible, but if it is, that's the choice. I would definitely say that in most cases to stay with the pet, you know, dog or cat or ferret or whatever, stay with them because they know you're there. Right. Uh, now, some people just can't handle that or if they're young children or, um, you know, it's, it's personal preference. Some people just can't handle it. But I think, it's, I think it's a more pleasant experience if everybody is together and supporting the cat and supporting that energy. Um, you know, if they, uh, now I've heard it said that, you know, the way they go out is the way they come back, you know, assuming you believe in reincarnation, which not everybody does, but, um, you know, you want their parting ways to be as peaceful as possible. And I don't know if it makes any difference on the other side or what's there, but um, I just, I just don't want it to be an unpleasant experience for anyone. Right. And I've, I've had clients bring their cats in with, and have candles and a whole ceremony, and it's, you know, and that's beautiful. Not everybody needs to do that. If you do, God bless you and do it. You know, right. It's it's all personal preference and what you what you feel from the from the cat. Um, and some cats just don't care. Yeah, whatever. Um, right. When I when puzzle when puzzle got old. Um, I kept getting a feeling from her that she didn't care one way or another. Um, she would stay or she would go, whatever worked for her. I checked with my animal communication, and she said that's exactly right. She didn't care. Today, tomorrow, next year, it doesn't matter. And, <laughs> and I, I thought about it a long time, and I thought, well, she's not really in, she's not in bad shape, and I think she has as, at least as many good hours as, unpleasant hours but I knew where we were going we were going down a hill and I decided to let her go higher up the hill then wait for her to get to the bottom of the hill and my philosophy about euthanasia is I would rather do it a day too soon than a day too late Mm -hmm. because a day too late means you suddenly get the message they're suffering and you can't they can't go fast enough at that point I would rather let them go um, before it gets to that point. I really would. That's a. I'm pretty. I'm pretty strong about that. Um, I've had uh, when I was my first job as a newbie vet. Um, when I got there, my boss immediately took off for a three week vacation, and she had worked with this cat and her buddy that they were going to the mountains together and um, that vet had also worked with this cat and they both said be sure if she brings that cat in be sure you euthanize it like what and why is this my job that you haven't been able to talk her into it right she brings in this cat it's absolutely flat um, can't move can't raise his head she had to express his bladder she had to force feed it it was mm. just yeah it was you know it wasn't even there and I'm like who are you doing this for? Because right. you're not doing this for the cat. And, you know, you need to put on your big girl pants and, and say, you know, okay, I get it. And she did. She did. She got it. Yeah. Somehow the way I said it um, helped her. And, yeah. you know, she knew, but she couldn't admit until somebody really just was in her face about it. And I, you know... However, in her face, I had to get I was willing to do that because this cat was miserable. Yeah. It had no quality of life at all. It was just existing. There was no pleasure to be had, and that's just wrong. Yes. Like, I, can't, I can't do that. And I get in this, I just had this discussion some, with another list that, um, well, I want my chronic renal failure cat to die at home naturally. Let me tell you how they die. Ammonia toxicity gives you a piercing headache. It is the worst. I have, I was, 
caught in an ammonia snow one time. It was like ice picks were being driven through my head, and it was instant. These cats are suffering. Mm-hmm. Do not think you can do that. Hyperthyroid cats, you know how they're going to die if they're not treated? Their heart is going to get enlarged in a bad way. They're going to throw a blood clot. It's going to paralyze them, and they're going to scream in pain until you get that injection in there. Mm. So, you know, dude, we are so privileged to be able to let them go. Yeah. That is, to me, it's the greatest gift of love that you can give. And, you know, that's my philosophy, and people will argue with me, and that's fine. But I have been so fortunate to be able to give a peaceful exit to thousands of animals, and it's a blessing. It really is. So, there you go. (laughs) Do you have recommendations for children? I, I have read that children below five or six years old or seven even, that they don't understand death and it won't make any difference if they're there or not. Um, For for grieving children or pets, flower essences, absolutely. Grief remedy, um, water violet, I believe, is the box flower for that. Um, Jackson has remedies for that. So, um, and and some, some animals will grieve not a lot. And I don't. It's not necessary for the for the other pets to be in the room, although they can. Um, when I had to euthanize Spencer, his brother Sundance, my my remaining cat, um, he came in. He got up on the bed. He walked across Spencer. Boop boop boop. And <laughs> it, he it was there was no recognition on either side <laughs> that this you know it was like. You know, and once once Spencer was gone, Sundance was not at the least bit interested in the body. He's not there. Why would he be? You know, right. these guys are communicating on levels we have no idea. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I figure animals are much smarter than we are about it. Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah. So don't try and explain it to four year old. You can just no. say they're, they're gone and they're not coming back. And you, you, when they're seven, you can explain why. You know, because <laughs> it's not gonna. It's not going to matter. I, it, you know, we all handle it in our own way, and you do what, what guides you and what works best for you and honor your feelings. And I can tell you that every single person, every single person that I said, you know, it may be time to think about, you know, letting them go, every single one said, oh, I knew you were going to say that. <sighs> I knew you were going to say that. They all knew. They just needed somebody else to, to validate it. And then, of course, I think, well, I know. And, of course, I knew. <laughs> yeah. You know, I walked in one morning, and and Flynn, Flynn's eyes were different. He was ready. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. hadn't been ready before. Right. But he was ready that day. You know. You will know, really. Yes. Give yourself credit. Your soul knows, and you will be told, mm-hmm. really. Trust yourself. I love that because that was the, the I've only ever had to put one cat down um knock on wood and I was so concerned about that how will I know if I do it too soon and my aunt was the one that said you will see it in his eyes I promise you yeah and then yeah. when I saw it I was like dang it <laughs> dang it now I know I have to do the deed um I understand yeah how important it is, but at that point in time, it was hard for me to, to say goodbye. Yeah. But, yes, you do know, Not, and it's crazy. There are, a few, there are a few old cats that will be able to go on their own, but I, I, I had a friend, my good friend Kate Solisti, she's an animal communicator. Her cat, Azul, was born under my desk. Mm. I had known him since he was two hours old. And he was, oh, 20-something, and... You know, we knew it was time. They live up in the mountains. I went up there. I bought everything, and he said, no, I'm not ready. And I said, Azul, you are going to need help. Mm. I can tell you, looking at you, that you are not going to be able to do this on your own. Nope, I'm going to do it on my own. And he hung on another three or four days, 
And then he's like, oh, you know what? Yeah, I do need help. <laughs> like, just some cats are so stubborn. And he was, yeah. he was a... He was a long-haired Siamese, so he may have a, had a little raggy in him. But oh my goodness, he was uh, the spirit was stubborn, but as will beat everyone. I I have never seen a cat as stubborn as Uli. And uh, <laughs> but he, he was just precious, and I was so sad that he had to go. But you know, I mean, what a privilege to know him and and see him throughout his whole life, and you know, right to the end, it was just so wonderful. To, yeah. to be able to give him that when he finally admitted that he needed it. Cats will say, I can do it, and they most often can't. So I don't care how much you want to let them die naturally. The chances are, odds are not in your favor. Chances are that they're not going to be able to, and they're going to need help, and, and you need to be ready and willing to give it to them. Yeah. Okay? Oh. Yeah. My my next appointment is here. Sorry. Okay. Well, um, and we've wrapped up, so we're, I think we're good. Okay. If perfect. You're good. Okay, okay. Well, thank you very much, <laughs> and we'll talk next time. Okay. Bye. Bye.